I would first like to thank um, Pietro Marani and Maria Teresa Fiorio for this wonderful exhibition. And I would like to thank very much Pietro Marani for inviting me for this conference. It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here. I would also like to acknowledge the Biblioteca Ambrosiana, the Biblioteca Leonardiana, the Louvre, the Royal Library at Windsor, and Corpus Christi College at Oxford for having very kindly provided images for my talk. My paper today is part of a more comprehensive research project on Leonardo's treatise and its 17th century reception, which I am preparing for publication as a book with the provisional title of Leonardo, Poussin and Rubens, Figures in Motion. Today, I'm going to look mainly at the human figure illustrations that appeared in the first printed edition of Leonardo's treatise. As is well known, his treatise was first published in Paris in 1651 in two parallel editions. One in French by Roulin Friard de Chambray and the other in Italian by Raphael Trichet Dufresne. Both editions offered the same basic group of illustrations. Those of the human figure were based on Charles Ehas' redrawings of Nicolas Poussin's designs. Ehas' redrawings were, in turn, engraved by René Lochon. However, little attention has been given to the fact that Dufresne's edition provided some additional illustrations by Ehas and a supplementary section on Leon Battista Alberti. I'm going to argue that when we look at the illustrations for the treatise within this overall context of Dufresne's edition, we can gain important insights into the process that led to the visual reshaping of Leonardo's principles of painting, first by Poussin and then by Aha. And that this study can also shed light on the wider reception of Leonardo's teachings in the emerging French Academy, the Académie Royale de Peinture et Sculpture. The illustrations of the human figure in the treatise relate to an important group of chapters in which Leonardo discusses balance and motion. For Leonardo, the condition for motion is this disruption of balance. In discussing this conception in relation to the human body, Leonardo examines a range of variations in the position of the limbs in order to understand the mechanics of motion and how to visually represent it. These are chapters from the Libro di Pittura, which contains the earliest and most complete compilation of Leonardo's ideas on painting. In the chapter illustrated on the left, Leonardo points out that the more forcefully the body is twisted or displaced in the direction opposite to the intended movement, the more powerful this movement will be. In the illustration on the right, the contrast between the two positions of the man throwing a spear indicates the power of his action and signals that movement occurs across space from one pose to the other. In Leonardo's conception, the course of an action is formed by a succession of infinitely varied transitions because movement occurs in space, and space is infinitely divisible. Leonardo understands motion as continuous quantity, quantità continua. A sense of the inherent kinetics of the human body emerges throughout Leonardo's drawings. A case in point is a sheet now in Windsor, in which the quick sequence of the various actions of a man with a hammer graphically evokes the idea of motion 
as a dynamic and continuous process. Similarly, in studies such as this one in Venice for the Bat of Anghiari, the forceful bending and twisting of the figures render visual Leonardo's theoretical ideas of motion discussed and illustrated in the treatise. It is important to note that although the treatise was mainly known until the end of the 18th century in the form of abridged copies of the Libro di Pittura, the chapters on human motion were in fact largely preserved in the abridgment and there were no major changes in the human figure illustrations. Where we witness a radical transformation in visual message is with Nicolas Poussin. Poussin consciously tones down the indecorous elements of instability that Leonardo uses as visual marks for violent movements. Poussin carefully modifies the positioning of the limbs, reducing twisting, bending, and overall imbalance. His human figures are devoid of the visual qualities that would evoke the sense of inherent motion, of being about to change position, and in so doing, of developing the course of a movement across space. Instead, Poussin's figures show a frozen pose in space and time, a suspended pause. In favoring more decorous poses, Poussin eliminates entire illustrations for chapters on violent movements, as well as individual figures, such as the one that would show here the final stage of the men's movement. In altering the number of illustration, illustrations, Poussin also draws extra figures for chapters on balance that had never been illustrated, but which confirms the decorous way he approaches Leonardo's treatise. Poussin's transformation of the human figures takes place via his direct use of selected antique statues as authorized models for decorous poses and canonical proportions. This extra figure that he offered, for instance, is a clear borrowing from the Farnese Hercules. I have discussed elsewhere the elaborate process by which Poussin incorporates antique references into his human figures. What we should bear in mind here is that in using several antique statues as models, of which the Farnese Hercules and the Belvedere Antinous are the most obvious ones, Poussin devises an ingenious method for achieving remarkable accuracy in the canonical proportions of his figures an accuracy that is retained across careful variations in poses, views, and scale. Unlike Leonardo, Poussin's main concern is not with forceful and transitory movements, but rather with fixed poses that allow canonical proportions to be decoded and expressed in a treatise that was itself to serve as a new model for the founding principles of the art of painting. The novelty of Poussin's illustrations was endorsed by both Chambray and Dufresne in their editions of the treatise in 1651. Dufresne points out that among the several manuscripts he used, he expressly chose a source for the illustrations the manuscript that he believed to contain Poussin's original figures. As for Chambray, his appreciation of Poussin's illustrations is even more explicit. Chambray not only dedicates his edition to Poussin, but also states that the treatise had two fathers, Leonardo and Poussin, and that it was actually Poussin who had brought the treatise 
to its final perfection. Poussin's alleged role as father of the treatise did not pass unchallenged. Poussin himself expressed an uneasy reaction about the illustrations published in 1651. In a famous letter addressed to Abraham Boss and partially published in Boss's Traité des pratiques géométrales et perspectives of 1665, Poussin makes clear what his part in the illustrations had been. First, Poussin clarifies that he had not drawn the geometrical figures as they had been the work of another artist, Pier Francesco Alberti. Second, Poussin explains that although he had drawn the human figure illustrations, they had been altered without his knowledge by the addition of awkward landscapes by Charles Zerat. Poussin's denial of his authorship of the geometrical illustrations gains particular significance when placed in the context of the criticisms expressed by Boss of several chapters on perspective in Leonardo's treatise, criticisms which included both the text and the geometrical illustrations. As for Poussin's disapproval of the interventions by Eha in the human figure illustrations, there has been much discussion about the reasons behind his reaction. Key studies by Kaufmann and by Damisch have similarly understood Poussin's reaction in light of his and of Boss's ideas on perspective, the latter's profoundly informed by Girard de Zarga's studies, as in contrast to the ideas of Eha and the leading views in the academy. Kaufmann points out that such differences are apparent in the methods of measurement of antique statues and of the spatial construction of paintings. Damisch shows that it has addition of backgrounds visually and conceptually interferes in the understanding of the human figure, which for Poussin functioned as a self-contained representation of spatial transformations in the human body itself. In support of these interpretations and to press them a little further, a close comparison between Poussin's and Eha's illustrations reveals additional levels of intervention by Eha. Besides the expected reversals, which are seen in most of the illustrations, Eha makes significant changes in dimensions and proportions. He enlarges 14 of the 21 human figures, as is the case with this one, evoking the Farnese Hercules, which was increased from 9.2 centimeters to 12 centimeters in height. However, it has overall changes in dimensions do not follow any apparent ratio or principle and visually undermine Poussin's calculated variations in size while keeping with canonical proportions. It has figures look heavier with overemphasized musculature. Although the adaptation of Poussin's figures for the purpose of engraving was bound to play a role in the new ways the figures looked, a has rendering of proportions seems less accurate than Poussin's. For instance, here, in the figure evoking the Farnese Hercules, his right shoulder appears relatively oversized, as does the upper part of that arm. Similarly, in the illustration of two men standing, the man with both feet on the floor has his bent arm oversized especially when compared to the thigh of his flexed leg. It has inconsistencies, contrasts, with Poussin's great accuracy in representing canonical proportions. In this respect, it is worth recalling that Poussin's brother-in-law, Jean Duguet, openly criticized Ehas' rendering of proportions as inaccurate 
and that Abraham Boss considered a has measured drawings after the antique of little use because the method of measurement adopted. In the specific case of the treaties, EHA transforms Poussin's carefully constructed figures of authorized proportions into much less rigorous references. Another significant difference concerns the rendering of expression. There is a consistent attempt by EHA to show more expressive physiognomic features. He lightens some of the dark areas covering portions of the faces in order to reveal stronger details of expression, such as in the face of the man throwing a stone. Other figures show a comparable reinforcement of the lines of the eyes, eyebrows, cheeks, and mouth. A has handling of expression prefigures aesthetic dispositions that would become fully developed in French art theory. The differences between Poussin's and de Haas illustrations also involve the addition of a range of single elements, from lion skins and a shepherd's pipe to amphorae, tree trunks, and fragments of classical architecture. Such elements do not just overload Poussin's design, but also provide them with a kind of narrative context that tends towards the decorative, revealing that Eha's pursuit of the classical ideal is rather ornamental. At the same time that the lion skin overstates the identification of Hercules, and the shepherd's pipe provides a superfluous context for the figure's pose, the addition of ornamental objects and fragments of classical architecture are at variance with Poussin's more focused approach to the antique via a rigorous attention to canonical proportions. What thus emerges from a close comparison of Poussin's and Eha's illustrations is that Eha's redrawings show a less theoretical interpretation of the antique, one which alters proportion and the overall expressiveness of forms. Nevertheless, Eha's transformations did not make significant changes to Poussin's main visual message, in which decorous figures, Alentica, were used to illustrate Leonardo's ideas on motion based on dynamic disruption of balance. Even in the case of Eha's addition of single elements, his aim is not to establish a break with Poussin's ascendancy but rather to re-evoke this affiliation. Eha makes use of a vocabulary that does find correspondence in Poussin's paintings, although he employs it in a way that reveals much more decorative aesthetic values. Now, the role of Eha in Dufresne's edition of the treatise was not limited to the illustrations for the chapters on balance and motion. Although the extent of his participation has been largely overlooked, Dufresne himself states that Teha had not only contributed new illustrations for chapters on drapery, but also that Teha had approved the inclusion of an entire new section containing Leon Battista Alberti's della pittura and della statua. When we look at Eha's contribution in the context of Dufresne's edition as a whole, we can gain important insights not only into the significance of his role, but also into the wider reception of Leonardo's treatise in light of the teaching needs and aesthetic ideals in and around the emerging Académie Royale de Peinture et Sculpture. Based on Dufresne's statement, the new illustrations that Teha drew can be identified with those of draped female figures. Indeed, they are not present in either the manuscript that contains Poussin's original drawings, 
the H228 Inferiore in the Biblioteca Ambrosiana, or in any of the five series of workshop copies that derived from it, namely those in manuscript Hermitage, manuscript Belt 36, manuscripts Brucker 1 and 2, those are new manuscripts, and the 16 loose illustrations in Windsor. In the absence of direct models by Poussin, Eha seems to have turned to Poussin's own paintings as visual references. Eha's procedure is analogous to the one he adopted when including single elements in the illustrations for the chapters on motion, just that here, he also reverses figures and adjusts poses. Poussin's Et in Arcadia Ego and Rebecca at the Well are likely to have been among those paintings Zeha used as visual references. And indeed, the link with Rebecca and the Well has been similarly suggested by Romano Nani. Along such lines, it is also interesting to note that one of Eha's illustrations for the Breviarum Romanorum of 1647 not only bear connections with the standing figure in one of the drapery chapters, but also seems based on Poussin's references. In drawing from Poussin's artistic vocabulary, which was in turn based on classical models, such as the Chesi Juno for the draped and mature female figure, Eha once again emulates Poussin's approach to the treatise via the antique. As for the reasons for Eha's addition of the drapery illustrations, they seem closely linked to contemporary interests. Although drapery played a rather minor role in Leonardo's treatise, the representation of ways of dressing and of different kinds of clothing stimulated discussions in the Académie. Drapery was seen as closely linked to the issues of perspective, proportion and decorum, and as such, it entered not only theoretical discourses from Chambres Idées of 1662 to Testelan's Sentiment of 1696, but also early academic debates, as we know retrospectively from Testelan's account of meetings prior to the official establishment of the Conférence in 1666. By offering additional illustrations for the drapery chapters, Eha thus extends Leonardo's treatise visually towards contemporary interests. Where we find a similar orientation is in the addition of the section on Alberti. That the inclusion of Alberti's treatises on perspective and sculpture was well planned is apparent from a number of internal pieces of evidence. To mention a few, the structures of the Alberti and the Leonardo sections are comparable, as both offer the treatises preceded by dedicatory letters and biographies written by Dufresne. Moreover, there is a close relationship in the use of the decorative illustrations to link the written materials in and across the Leonardo and the Alberti sections, which creates a remarkable level of visual cohesion throughout. What is more, Alberti's Della Pittura and Della Statua could offer complementary materials to what was seen as controversial or marginal subjects in Leonardo's treatise, subjects which, nevertheless, were crucial in establishing the founding principles of painting in the emerging academy. Such was particularly the case with perspective, as well as with proportion. The importance ascribed to both subjects emerges from the attempts in the academy to define the main parts of the art of painting. The earliest recorded in the Procès Verbaux, dating back to 1653. 
but Linea perspective did not occupy a central place in Leonardo's treatise, and the few chapters that did address the subject did not provide the basic geometrical foundations, as did Alberti's della Pittura, especially with the illustrations that were retained from Cosimo Bartoli's edition of 1568. Similarly, Leonardo's chapters on proportion were mainly concerned with changes in size, in the size of limbs according to movement and growth, rather than with a method for measuring models and with a fixed canon of proportions. It was Albertis della Statua that could lend support to contemporary directives towards the decoding of the proportional canons of antiquity. In this respect, it is worth recalling that Eha, who had endorsed the inclusion of the Alberti section and has been its dedicatee, was actually one of the founding members of the Academy in 1648. The inclusion of Alberti's treatises as suitable extensions gains further significance against contemporary criticisms to Leonardo's treatise. Although Abraham Bosse's disapproval of several chapters relating to perspective were expressed in a formal way only in his geometrical treatise of 1665, they reflect earlier controversies that led to his expulsion from the Academy in 1661 and which hark back to the 1650s. Moreover, signs of Bosse's early criticisms of Leonardo's treatise are apparent in his dissuading André Filibien to publish it. The episode took place soon after Filibien's return from Rome to Paris in 1649, which clearly places Bosse's criticisms in the context of the pre-1651 edition. Although Bosse's remarks on the chapters on proportion are less known, they did include the only chapter in which Leonardo briefly alludes to a system of measurement of statues. When we consider Bosse's direct criticisms and, on the other hand, the importance that was ascribed to perspective and proportion in the early academic context, the inclusion of Alberti's treatises seems all the more to match contemporary needs. This is not to say that Leonardo's treatise itself did not acquire a quick and fundamental place in the academic instruction, but that the early awareness of its shortcomings most likely contributed to its publication with Alberti's Della Pittura and Della Statua. What provides the most remarkable example of the connection between Leonardo and Alberti in the 1651 edition, and also of their correspondence in visual message, is the illustration that they had designed for Alberti's della Statua. Eha deliberately replaced the earlier human figure offered in Bartoli's edition. Eha's new classicizing figure evokes the Belvedere Antinous, as it has been convincingly pointed out by Marco Collaretta. If we are to develop Collaretta's identification further, we can say that Eha's figure is comparable in the choice of the antique model to several figures illustrating Leonardo's treatise. Thus, in making use of the Antinous, Eha consciously reapplies Poussin's procedures, and in such a way that visualizations of Leonardo's ideas on motion and of Alberti's teachings on sculpture were to serve the same aesthetic ideal. This idea was founded upon authorized antique exemplars of decorous poses and canonical proportions. Eha, in endorsing Poussin's visual reshaping of the treatise throughout the 1651 edition, 
is not only sustaining contemporary aspirations, but also promoting a very particular view of Leonardo's teachings on painting, one which remained unchallenged for the next 150 years. Thank you. <laughs>